I think about all these all these people in war zones, all these kids growing up, all these, you know, this, this huge swath of human beings that are living with this trauma, passing it on to their children in some form or another, and wow. Uh, yeah. No, it's I, I, I sometimes I think of it like if you could imagine in your own family if your your daughter or your sister or your mother had been raped, what that does to the family, how it affects the family, and in, in, a, in at least in the conflict area, we're generally talking about many victims. So it's your family, it's your neighbor and their family and their neighbor and your storekeeper and your doctor and you end up having a village that is wounded, is damaged and that makes it for a, a larger community and I think just like an individual you, have a, you can have a very damaged, harmed community as much as the individual and it takes a while for, for the whole community to recover. And it, and, it, and it won't until the individuals can recover. So the recovery is, is, uh, has to do with, among other things, with talking about it, with feeling free enough to talk about it. Uh, is there any other parts of this? Well, I think it's very, very important to learn how to cope with the anxiety that is raised by fearing people. You know, when you're sexually assaulted, oftentimes your um, experience with others is damaged because you're fearful that someone else may betray you, someone else may harm you. And so it's very important to have healing relationships, to have opportunities for healthy relationships. I, I think it's also important to kind of, you know, think of some of the symptoms we're talking about as survival skills. They emerged because they may have helped someone survive. So when you have a situation where somebody might kind of escape into their mind or escape into fantasy, because what's going on in real time is so awful. However, that can look like dissociation or that can look like they're just kind of not mm -hmm. present afterwards. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it too, I think, is kind of working with them to see what's fueling these behaviors and then helping them learn um, you know, something that's gonna be more adaptive in that setting. But this work really does need to be one-on-one, -on -one, right? I mean, there are an awful lot of victims and not an awful lot of psychologists. Uh, we, we do do the work individually and in groups. And I have to say with children, it's incredibly heartwarming to see children meet other children mm -hmm. who've been through a similar experience. It's a very concrete way of showing a child that there's nothing wrong with them and sharing with them that there's another child who's as nice as you are, who you're able to meet, who mm -hmm. had a very similar experience. So group therapy can be very, very healing as well. Mm -hmm. One of the things that stands out when I um, worked at CARES with Esther is that I remember a parent saying to me once, because we only saw abuse victims, said all the children in the, in the waiting room just seemed like normal kids. They were all playing, but I knew why they were all here. But that's the point. They're normal kids and they were playing and they looked like normal kids and they liked the same things other kids did. So I think that was very heartening too, yes, just the, the kindredness.